Hey, I'm Dylan, and welcome to My Whole Thing, a show about the media we immerse ourselves in so deeply that it starts to take the place of reality. After posting my last video about the first Cloverfield ARG, I received a tsunami of comments begging me to make one about the 10 Cloverfield Lane ARG. There's so many. So here you are, watching me, a digital monkey, clang together my digital symbols for your enjoyment. And I'm recording this from quarantine in a figurative bunker of sorts, which is a bit on the nose, but what you gonna do? So let this be a lesson to you. Cyberbullying someone into creating the exact content you want to see works. Yay! Let's dive in. The first film was notoriously produced by master of the mystery box J.J. Abrams, or as we know him formally on this show, Daddy J.J. However, at the time Dan Trachtenberg was being brought on board by Bad Robot to direct the script by Josh Campbell and Matt Stukin, J.J. was away in his workshop, working on these small passion projects directed at a niche group of sci-fi enthusiasts. As such, J.J. wasn't as involved in the production of 10 Cloverfield Lane as he was in the first film. Or maybe that's what he wants us to think. Cut to January 2016. Michael Bay's 13 Hours hits theaters with a special new trailer attached. The trailer begins with a shot of a jukebox. We see John Goodman, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, and John Gallagher Jr. living a cozy, domestic life for a minute or two before everything goes off the rails and John Goodman tells us... Something's coming. It's here we notice the Cloverfield ARGs have found a formula. This is the second time that JJ has attached a Cloverfield trailer debut to a Michael Bay film, giving us some specific numbers at the top of the ARG, and introduced us to a soft drink in order to get the ARG started. Meet Swamp Pop. Swamp Pop is a real company, whereas Slusho is a fictional product of the JJ-verse. Swamp Pop was founded in 2013 by these two babies named John and Colin, who coincidentally grew up to be adults named John and Colin. The brand is based in Lafayette, Louisiana, our first potential clue about the setting of our story. The Swamp Pop website bears the slogan, you can't drink just four, which seems like a blatant reference to the Slusho slogan from the first Cloverfield ARG. The most conspicuous thing on Swamp Pop's site is an item on their product matrix, the long-term shelter supply priced at $4,813, the same as our jukebox number from the trailer. The 15-year shelter supply is listed as sold out. It should be noted, drinking nothing but a soda sweetened with cane sugar for 15 years straight might result in you not lasting a full 15 years. Just a thought. Fans begin ordering six packs of Swamp Pop and find puzzle pieces tucked away inside their orders. Fans post pictures of the pieces they receive to Reddit and Unfiction and slowly start putting them together like a pizza you're putting back together for some reason. Slowly, fans discover their pieces belong to a puzzle of the Eiffel Tower. In the trailer, we catch a glimpse of a few framed pictures of the Eiffel Tower. Could this be our first international Cloverfield? Or perhaps this is a nod to Louisiana, which has its own special ties to French culture. More on that later. So it begs the question, did Daddy JJ orchestrate the meeting of these two babies so they can grow up to be soda creators and then he can incorporate them into his movie game? Who's to say? But the ARG is officially on, so fans turn to our old ARG standby, the Tagorato website. If you're unfamiliar, I encourage you to go watch my video for the first Cloverfield ARG. Turns out, our favorite evil deep sea drilling corporation who woke up our sweet baby kaiju by crashing a chimpanzee-3 satellite into the ocean is back. Fans who emailed the Tagorato offices received this automated email reply from a PR rep, saying the account is no longer active. But for an inactive account, the email seems a little more built out than the Tagorato emails from the days of the first Cloverfield, complete with this slightly braggy employee of the month email signature, Vanessa. But that was January 30th. Roll the clocks forward a few days and fans are still receiving identical emails about the inactive account. However, the email is now displaying a new employee of the month for February an indication the Tagorato site is being updated by someone, and that Vanessa and Dr. Fang are both super jazzed about their jobs creating auto-reply emails. Fans proceed to comb the Tagorato site for any new information and unearth our next major clue. The official Tagorato Employee of the Month lists for January and February, outlining star employees from each of Tagorato's subsidiaries. Included on these pages are both Vanessa and Dr. Fang from the email signatures, but one other employee stands out. All right, let's see. Um, agreeable, kindness, warmth, uh, showered recently, um, attends Bible study, John Goodman, nice teeth, wait a sec. The February employee of the month for Tagorato Satellite Division, Bold Futura, is a man named Howard Stambler. Howard's shirt appears to read, Radio Man 70, 
speculated to be a reference to the now discontinued Radio Man ranking for Navy men who specialized in communications technology. The number 70 could refer to the year 1970, suggesting Howard served during the Vietnam War. Searching Radio Man 70 brings up RadioMan70.com. Visiting the address triggers a site redirect to a page called funandprettythings.com. At first it appears to be a basic blog page, perhaps belonging to a girly tween like the ones who follow me on Tumblr. But upon closer inspection, a few things stand out. First, the image of the Eiffel Tower ties into our puzzle pieces and trailer findings. When trying to inspect the page's source code for clues, written in the script is this message. You do not belong here. Megan would never come here. I know who you are and will be tracking you. The missing letters on the alphabet bracelet image spell out Megan. But most important is the image of the old computer screen. It's the only image on the page with an embedded link. Clicking through pulls up a login prompt. A quick reverse image search reveals it's a screen cap from a scene in Pretty in Pink, the scene where Molly Ringwald's character receives a message while studying in the library. Entering the phrase from the computer screen unlocks a secret message board, and the fulcrum upon which the rest of the ARG rests. The only message on the board is from Howard to his daughter Megan. It seems Howard is divorced or separated, and Megan is now living with her mother in Chicago. Howard mentions having to secretly contact Megan without her mother's knowledge in order to protect her from some impending danger related to something he saw during his time in the Navy, something the Soviets were working on. Howard says he's built two bunkers, one wherever he lives currently, and one near Megan in Chicago. He instructs Megan to travel to him so they can hide in his bunker together. The post has a reply box. Attempting to write a reply brings up a dialog box asking if you're Megan. Answering yes brings up another prompt. What was the secret gift I gave you on your 13th birthday? Fans try everything they can think of, from guesses based on the Fun and Pretty Things homepage to complete shots in the dark. Nothing works. The following week, a new message from Howard appears on Fun and Pretty Things. He notes that he lives in New Orleans and that Megan's favorite ice cream flavor is mint chocolate chip, which we can only assume he mentioned because it's completely integral to the story. Fans also note that a previously dead link on the message board that Howard urges Megan to keep checking has been updated. The link pulls up a survival resource list, including information about how to put together a getaway bag, how to hotwire a car, and links to information about train schedules and weather forecasts. You know, girl stuff. Howard urges Megan to travel to New Orleans as quickly as possible, insisting she takes the train from Chicago, warning that taking a plane is too dangerous right now. The following weekend, five new Cloverfield trailers make their debut in theaters, playing before different films. The five trailers are all identical, except for five different secret images that flash briefly before the end of the trailer. And this is how I know Cloverheads are the most devoted fans. People start going to the theaters and risking a five-year prison sentence and a $250,000 fine just so they could record the trailer with their phones. We can make out some words and numbers, but fans claim to see hidden words in the secret images in person. But with the dark, low-quality cell phone photos they took, we just have to take their word for it. Howard posts to Fun and Pretty Things, linking Megan to a real-life news article about a New Orleans train track fire. Howard says that train travel is now completely off the table. It makes you wonder though, did someone light an entire train track on fire just so they could incorporate it into their movie game plot? Who's to say, but now Megan definitely has to hotwire a fun and pretty car. A few days later, Howard makes a new post ranting about his old job working on spy satellites. He tells Megan he worked for CSAT, a real-life military satellite program that monitored the oceans and atmospheric conditions, but Howard says they were actually spying on the Soviets. Howard goes on, saying his mentor was accused of being a double agent who sold secrets to the Soviets and was sent to jail for 365 years. Turns out, there was a real-life Navy radio man named Jerry Whitworth, a member of the Walker spy ring who was sentenced to 365 years for selling secret information to the Soviets. Who was Jerry Whitworth spying for? Was it for the Russians, the Walker spy ring, or was it for someone else who knew he would be caught and tried, and then 30 years later he could serve as a bit of flavor text in a movie ARG? Who's to say? Howard also links Megan to an article about a recent US military satellite launch that he says proves the government is trying to cover up whatever he discovered. This was a real life documented satellite launch that happened on February 10th, 2016. Was it a routine reconnaissance Delta IV satellite launch? 
Or did somebody fans hard at work on the trailer images puzzle finally locate high resolution versions of the trailers on YouTube using search terms like Sailor Monkey Cloverfield and Navy Football Cloverfield. Each image clearly features a set of numbers. Cranking up the exposure on the images reveals fans were right about the presence of hidden words and shows the numbers are circled. Ordering the numbers in the images by alphabetizing the words they're associated with produces this sequence, which appears to be a set of coordinates set squarely in an empty lot near Covington, Louisiana, about 50 miles north of New Orleans. Within hours, a Clover fan from Reddit was on the scene, camera in hand. The fan arrives at the empty lot and finds a mound of dirt that appears to be freshly dug up. What's more, it's marked with a familiar object, an empty bottle of Swamp Pop. The fan begins digging and he finds our next clue, and it's a big one, an ammo box. The ammo box contains a variety of survival supplies, a puzzle piece from the catfish puzzle shown in the trailer, and two USB drives. A handwritten note reads, Listen to these, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's almost right on top of us. You'll need a whole lot more than this kit if you're going to have a chance to make it to the other side. Good luck to us all, friend. Signed, H. The USB drives both contain a copy of the same audio file, which appears to be a correspondence between Mission Control and the International Space Station. The conversation starts off fairly benign. Uh, anything I've seen before. Flight is a Capcom. Go ahead, Capcom. We may have an off nominal situation with AMS-02. Have we heard from Spacecom about any activity in the area? Negative. Uh, data stream is intact, so likely not. Check with ESOC and Sakuba. Find out if they're seeing the same thing we are. And it says it doesn't appear to be equipment failure. Space Command, this is the flight director at Johnson. You guys testing something we don't know about? Okay, uh, You guys are sure? Europe is seeing the same thing. Okay. The Kuba confirms as well. Space Command says they don't have anything up there. Uh, we're seeing another burst in the signal. This one is bigger. Uh, it would have to be something really big to generate this type of magnetic field. Can you get a visual on the AMS? Yeah, Renee's looking now. Yeah, Capcom, Renee thinks he saw something. Look. ISS, what was that? Do you copy? Yeah, we copied Houston. There was a uh, flash of red light that seemed to come from uh, everywhere, and uh, then it was gone. Copy ISS. Yeah, we copied Houston. Tell him to clear it up. ISS, flight would like you to execute procedure 2380A. Scrub this from the mission logs. Wipe the signal, please. Notify ESOC and Sakuba to disregard. Confirm, Houston. Wow, jump scare! <laughs> Maybe Howard isn't as paranoid and anxious as we thought. Anyways, Howard updates fun and pretty things, and he's made an apocalypse survival simulator for his teenage daughter. The game is built into the site. It's a text-based simulation of doomsday bunker life. Think the Oregon Trail. But instead of traveling across the country, the game requires players to live in a bunker, choose their supplies, and complete chores that maintain their health, morale, fuel, and oxygen supply. The game ends when the players die, which can happen for a variety of reasons, like running out of oxygen, fuel, or the people in the bunker killing each other. I played the game, and to be honest, I was terrible at it. For about a week, fans play the game aggressively till characters surpass a thousand days in the bunker simulation, at which point, a secret message from Howard is unlocked. The message reveals another dead drop location, set up by Howard for Megan to find, this time in a locker at a hostel in downtown Chicago next to the Art Institute. A fan from Reddit quickly rushes over to retrieve the dead drop package. In the locker was an Eiffel Tower backpack, Okay, now we've cracked the Eiffel Tower puzzle. Turns out Howard's just one of those dads who heard his kid mention that they like something one time and then proceeds to get them that thing over and over again for the rest of their lives. Anyways, inside the backpack is a cell phone. 
The phone is brand new and almost completely empty, except for a single voicemail. Please enter your password, then press pound. So the password? You have one saved voice message. To listen to your messages, press one. First saved voice message. Megan, as promised, a phone just for you and me to talk. Keep it hidden so your mother doesn't want to miss, too. I put my number into the contacts. Call me as soon as you can. I need to hear your voice. And I gotta get you out of Chicago before everything happens. Your life is in real danger, radio girl. But I promise to keep you safe. Call me, please. Love, Dad. Shortly after the discovery, the fan released Howard's phone number to the fan community on Reddit and Unfiction, which turned out to be a mistake. Howard's voicemail inbox was immediately filled with fans calling in. Shortly after, Howard posts to Fun and Pretty Things, mentioning the dead drop phone, but saying that he hadn't heard from Megan, likely an indication that the phone is now out of play. Just another reminder why we can't have nice things. Tagarato updates their Employee of the Month page March 1st with a new batch of employees. There doesn't seem to be anything of consequence. Though Art Reynoso won Employee of the Month because of his wife's bomb-ass cookies? So we're gonna rewrite the ARG for the real MVP on that one. Fun and Pretty Things updates with a new rant from Howard. This time he's griping about how Megan's mom is trying to sell the family silverware to a random stranger. Fans begin searching for used silverware listings around New Orleans and Chicago, and discover a Craigslist post linked to an apartment complex near downtown Chicago. Subtle clues alert the viewer that this might be a part of the ARG. Fans reach out to the seller, using various tactics to earn her trust, from posing as in-game characters, to just being really, really annoying. The most successful fan went the route of concerned third-party onlooker, sharing all of Howard's correspondence with Megan, including his messages on fun and pretty things. In her final email to the fan, the seller reveals her name is Denise Paulson. Perhaps this is her maiden name, or she remarried. She reveals some painful information about their former marriage, including an anecdote about how Howard forced the family to hide in the basement during one of his panics. Denise said Howard held his hand over 11-year-old Megan's mouth till she couldn't breathe in an attempt to keep her quiet. Shortly after, Fun and Pretty Things updates with a new post, but this time it's from Denise. She begs Howard to leave her and Megan alone and to seek help for his paranoia. Several days later, another message appears on Fun and Pretty Things, this time authored by a mysterious, unnamed poster using the initials NR. Fans theorize it's Bold Futura employee Nikolai Rosa from the March Employee of the Month post, who's described as working on an undisclosed special project with the military. Nikolai acknowledges his difficult history with Howard, but claims his message is urgent, and then links to a strange audio file. It begins with strange music, before descending into a series of random beeping sounds. Fans begin dissecting the file and shortly after identify it's been encoded using a ham radio technique, known as SSTV, or slow scan TV, a method of broadcasting that allows one to transmit images using a radio signal. Running the file through an MMS TV decoder program generates the following image. Shortly after, Howard updates his outgoing voicemail message. That phone belongs to my daughter. I don't know how you got it, but it doesn't matter much anyways. It's happening, and I wish everyone just listened to me. I could have helped you all if you just listened. The fan in possession of Megan's phone receives a text from Howard, asking them to clear out the voicemail so he can leave a message. The fan complies, and Howard leaves this voicemail. The following day, the film was released and the ARG was concluded. 
I hope this inspires you to check out the rest of the franchise and check out my first video on the first Cloverfield ARG. And remember, it's okay to go digging around in an empty lot if JJ Abrams told you to. Till next time, I'm Dylan, and that's my whole thing. <laughs>